So, thank you very much. I apologize, I, I brought with me a very bad cough. Before I go into my paper, I want to say a little bit as to why I got myself involved in thinking about German order liberalism. And that was against the background of the recession in 2008 2009, when many people said that uh, the neoliberal state had it. There was the crisis of neoliberalism, the economy that was free fell apart, and the neoliberal state therefore had to change into a more order liberal direction, it was argued, to provide restraint on competition and more orderly conduct of the economy and to organize the economy in more socially fair ways. And I thought that was a very strange statement to make. Uh, for once, neoliberalism, as far as I then knew, never really said that the free economy goes together with the weak state. What does it mean to say weak state, wimpish state? How does the state, when it's weak, render the economy competitive? It was argued under neoliberalism the state flexibilized labor markets as a weak state. It was argued under neoliberalism the state uh, fought back collective interest organizations like the trade unions as a weak state. How can the weak state confront collective organization, flexibilize, flexibilize labor markets, deregulate banking practices? What does it mean to say the state of neoliberalism is weak? So that got me into reading about neo, not neoliberalism, but German order liberalism. And German order liberalism emerged in the late 1920s, early 1930s, at the crest, as it were, of what proved quickly to be the fatal crisis of the Weimar Republic. These order liberals asked themselves the Lenin question. What, what needs to be done? What is necessary? What do we do to reassert liberty? To get the economy back as a liberal economy? To fight back collectivist interests, be it that of the Bolsheviks, communists, the social democrats, the welfare providers, the so on, and so on. How, how, what, what do we need to do to restore the rationality of a liberal economy? What is our agency? Who does it for us? These other liberals then argued against laissez-faire liberalism. They said, it's just a theology. It's just a religion. It's just a dream. The invisible hand. Have you ever seen the invisible hand cope with a riot? Where's it fair? They said. It's no answer to riots. Where's it fair? It's no answer to political, private, or political interests in society that assert themselves. Where's it fair? It's no answer to crisis either. Where's it fair? They say. It's an economic order, but laissez-faire is not something on which policy can be based. Laissez-faire. You make the wrong decisions in an election, the wrong party wins, off it goes to Parliament, and what results is economic chaos. Laissez-faire. There's no answer to that. Either we, they say, have values, 
which we defend and stand for and stand up for, or we don't. And if we don't, then fair enough, salary. That's life. There's our nice liberty and now it's gone. No, they said, we have to fight for our values. We have to fight to restore free economy. We have to fight for liberty. Freedom. What is freedom without order? Have you ever thought about cutthroat competition? And what it means when you cut somebody's throat and blood spills out? That's not good competition. That's bloodshed. That's disorder. There needs to be rules. There need to be rules of the game. And these rules need to be enforced by a central agency. Freedom of competition. What is the tendency of the freedom of competition, they say? On the one hand, as I mentioned already, it's the lynch mob, cutthroat competition. And the other tendency of competition, they say, is monopoly where you use your freedom for illiberal purposes. You fix prices. You protect markets. You avoid competition. But is this a fair, not an argument for competition? And is it therefore the case that freedom can be free? You can use it whichever way you wish? Nonsense! They say, there needs to be a central agency to make sure that each one of us uses the freedom that we have for the sake of freedom, not for the sake of bloodshed and disorder, not for illiberal purposes, but that we use our freedom for the sake of the system of liberty. Now, who is responsible? Who is the central agency that facilitates, enables, sets the rules, punishes the, uh, those who do obey the rules? What is the central agency? And they say the central agency is the state. It's the liberal state. So they said in the late 1920s, early 1930s, in order to rediscover the logic of the free economy, in order to return to a liberal economy, in order to return to a free labor economy, and with the free labor economy, of course, the freedom of labor is entailed in its concept. The free labour economy doesn't entail a policy of full employment. A free labour economy for them doesn't entail welfare state insurance. A free economy means a freedom of labour in its concept, the doubly free labourer, who by his or her own free will sells what is left, their labour power, <coughs> on markets at prevailing prices. Is it not the case, they said, that freedom entails responsibility for that freedom? What is freedom without being responsible for the actions that you take in freedom? That's not freedom. That's the use of the state as an insurance company that insures everybody against every conceivable risk from the cradle to the grave. That, that is not Freedom. freedom is to be responsible for yourself. Freedom means to be responsible for the actions that you take. And freedom, therefore, also means that you are not only responsible, but also liable for what you have done. No, no, you are you. You are unemployed. How irresponsible of you. How dare you ask the state to offer you a handout? 
Why don't you look at yourself in the mirror and say, Today, today, today I really will be an entrepreneur of my labor part and take responsibility for myself. That, they say, is something that needs to be achieved. And it clearly cannot be achieved by the irresponsible use of freedom, by collective organization, by trade union monopoly on the labor market, by workers who, with great masses, demand freedom from want and look at the state as some sort of secularized god that can provide for them. No, 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 they say. We have to have a free economy, a free labor economy. In a free labor economy, the laborer is not enslaved by the plant, but is subject of the market, governed by the price mechanism, governed by the relations of demand and supply. Wages can go up, they also go down. If you are unemployed here and a job offer makes itself available over there, well, get a move on. Get on your bike. Be responsible. So they say, the free economy is not good just to have laws of freedom, declarations of freedom. And then you have people who, who don't have the will for it, who lack the will for freedom. So they say, the state, our state, is not only therefore responsible to provide the legal framework, the rules of the game. No, no. We also, they say, have to facilitate the social conditions and the moral conditions. The moral conditions mean that you have a will for enterprise, that you sense your responsibility for your freedom, for yourself, for your own conditions. Don't ask what others can do for you. Ask what you can do for yourself. That, they say, requires the state to provide the psycho-moral forces that a free economy requires. So that, in a nutshell, is what they argued in the late 1920s and early 1930s. In 1933, with the coming to power of Hitler, some left immigrated, couldn't stand the guy. Other state moved into, as it were, internal exile. Others became devout, only later to realize that they had followed the wrong religion in 1945. So not all of them were fascists. Some of them were strong-minded, courageous Republicans and left. Now let's look into what I had to say more closely, particularly towards the end in relationship to the crisis of 2008 and what that means for the neoliberal conception of the state. The first quotation I have to start the paper off is from Adam Smith. And Adam Smith, uh, the, the, the quotation is about the definition of political economy. And Adam Smith does not define political economy as the science of the invisible hand. He doesn't do it. He does not define political economy as the science of liberty. Nah, doesn't do it. He defines political economy as a political science. And I quote, political economy 
is a branch of the science of the statesman or legislator. So it's a political science, not an economic science, not a theology either, not, not a science of the invisible hand. The next quote comes from Alfred müller armert uh, a German order liberal, who asked for a coup d'etat in 1932 to rescue liberty. Uh, 1933 he thought Hitler, oh, what a fine man. In 1945 he, he left that behind and became a Democrat again and was the chief German negotiator for the uh, treaties of Rome. Most important German at the European negotiations in the 1950s. Quote, the liberal state has to be as strong as possible within its own sphere, but outside its own sphere, in the economic sphere, it has to have as little power as possible. The third quotation is from Victor Wanberg, who is a contemporary professor, now retired, at the Walter Eucken Institute in Freiburg. In other words, he is the professor, or was the professor, of German auto liberalism. And the quote is from 19, no, from 2014, quite recent. He says, the formula strong state was meant by the auto liberals as a shorthand for a state that is constrained by a political constitution that prevents government from becoming the target of special interest and seeking. In other words, a constitution that restrains the government from becoming the target from, of welfare seeking proletarians. A target of trade unions and other such private interests who uh, don't want to compete on the labor market. Instead, look at the state for welfare security, welfare handouts. And he says, the strong state is the one that resists it. It doesn't let itself become the prey of these proletarians. That stands apart. That draws a line between itself and society, that does not allow society to govern through the state, but rather governs over society, to render it competitive, entrepreneurial, responsible, liable for its own actions, ready to follow the price mechanism, wherever it takes you. I guess <coughs> the idea that the liberal state is a strong state is often rejected because the liberal state sees itself to be a limited state. It limits itself. And on that basis, it is often argued, the state that limits itself is in fact limited, like it's also disabled, no? not quite ready to move in, disempowered, lacking autonomy over the economy, unable somehow to make itself heard vis-à-vis -vis the market. And if, one were, if one does think in these terms, then one misses the boat, one misses the argument. For the order liberals, or for the neoliberals, the state that is limited is the strong state. Because it is only the strong state that is able to limit itself. That says, these are the rules, live by them that says to the welfare-seeking proletarian, 
be responsible. Bug off. I'm not going to support you. Look after yourself. So the strong state is, for them, the limited state. And the limited state facilitates. The limited state enables the system of liberty. The system of what Marx calls the system of the Eden of human rights, where everybody exchanges with everybody else on labor markets, regardless of the inequality in property, as equals before the rule of law, each seeking to better themselves by means of a contract that they enter into in liberty, in freedom by their own volition. And this, the neoliberals say, is the occupation, is the purpose of the strong state. To render this Eden of human rights, to make it effective, to manifest it, to facilitate it, and to remove any threats from its operation. So these exchanges on the labor market between people, each the same as the other in the eye of the law, is regulated by the price mechanism. It's, yeah, people exchange, move on if they can. It's regulated by what is called the invisible hand. That calculates, as it were, all our choices, all our preferences, and tells us where to invest, what to buy, what to sell, where to disinvest. So the invisible hand is the so-called, as it were, non-coerced regulator of the free market, of the equality of the By itself, they say, the invisible hand does nothing. The invisible hand destroys. The invisible hand does not create order. The strong state, they say, is the political form of the invisible hand. It provides the rules of equality. It provides the rules where everybody is at liberty. Nobody here is coerced personally by anybody else. Everybody is obliged to obey the rule, the law, but not people, not persons. That is what the invisible hand requires for its operation. And for it to operate, the rules have to be in place. The law has to be in place. The enforcement of this has to be in place. Between clashes of equal rights, adjudication, adjudication has to take place. All of that, they say, presupposes the state. As the facilitator, as the enabler, as the maker of the rule of law, of the equality of power, even of human rights. Now they say, here is the invisible hand, and it hits you. What the hell do you do now? Do you invest somewhere else? Or do you politicize, demand action, protectionism, monopoly pricing, cartels, taxes on importers to protect the national industry, labor market protection, welfare security? Is that what you do when the invisible hand hits you? No. 
what you do is you get hit and you move on and find a place where you can prosper. But they say, people don't do that. Companies don't do that. They seek protection. And what gives them protection is in fact the weak state. The state that lets itself be drawn into society. The state that lets itself become the prey of private, of the private interests. The state that responds to the political assertion of society by making social concerns, individual concerns, a matter of public policy. That, they say, is a weak state. The weak state does not know how to distinguish itself from society. In fact, society socializes the state. It is, they say, as if the state becomes the prey of the many competing private interests. The prey of the antagonistic interests. And as a consequence, they say, the weak state allows society to govern through the state, thereby undermining the liberal utility of the state as the independent power of society. But what does it mean if society governs through the state? They say the state fragments. You know, our agricultural interests, they capture the agricultural ministry. And the agricultural ministry translates the private concerns of farmers into a matter of public policy. Here are our workers. They capture the state. And they transform the state into an employment agency, the welfare agency. That's their state. And here, they say, are the financial interests. They capture the finance ministry and make the finance ministry their public office. And here, they say, is the industry, the exporters and the importers. Each one of them captures a bit of the state, thereby transforming their own private interests their own private concerns into matters of public policy, fragmenting, decomposing this great machine into many offices, none of which governs society. Each one of that has allowed society to govern through it. And that, they say, is chaos, planned chaos. That, they say, is the end of liberty. That is the end of the system of liberty. That, they say, is the end of freedom. That, they say, is the beginning of tyranny. At the heart of it, they say, is the weak state that fails to govern, that lets itself be governed that does not know how to distinguish itself from society and thereby loses its independence from society. This state is not worth its name. It's a weak state. It's an unlimited state. And the unlimited state is the state, they say, which politicizes everything. Everything. It's now a matter of politics. You want to change your job tomorrow? No. It's a bureaucratic decision to be taken by an office holder of the state. That is, they say, what happens. Now, how do you move society out of the state? How do you reassert the distinction between society and the state? How? Do you fight back? How do you rediscover, not necessarily the free economy, but the independence of the state as the concentrated power, as the independent force of a free economy? The problem, the problem is democracy. 
How do you marry it, they say, with the liberal state? How do, how do you secure the liberal foundation of the state against the background of an unlimited mass democratic system that is run, they say, by mass emotions, mass demands, mass parties, mass politics, mass redistribution? How do, you, how do you secure liberty? How do you hatch democracy in? That's the big question. But for the economy, they say, the question is a different one. For the economy, the question is, how do you institute an economic constitution that allows the greatest possible scope for individual responsibility and initiative and entrepreneurship, where each one of us behaves as entrepreneurs of our own labor power, of our own investment, of our own purposes, where none of us ever asks the state to step in to do something for him or her, where each one of us is a facilitated, willing entrepreneur. How do we do that? There is therefore, they say, an interdependence between economic freedom, the invisible hand, and the political state. Now let's look at the notion of the political state for a moment and return briefly to the Eden of Human Rights that Marx describes in Chapter 6 of Capital. Trade, where the traders in labour power meet freely as equals in liberty and freedom on the market to exchange what they can exchange. What has their argument about the political state to do with that? The political state for the order liberals is the state that successfully depoliticizes society. Politics can have nothing to do with a society or inner society where each follows their own interests in competition with everybody else, in a system of liberty, exchanging equivalences based on the rule of law as equals. That society is a society of non-coercion, non-violence. There might, of course, be economic compulsion. People might die. But not as a consequence of coercion, it's just they ain't got enough food. That's nobody's responsibility, it's their own <coughs> responsibility. But if they fight back and demand, then clearly they politicize. They manifest a certain selves politically. They don't assert themselves as entrepreneurs who are self-responsible for their freedom and liable to the decisions or the decisions that they have taken. No, they stand up and shout and riot and demand and so on. And that is a political manifestation which undermines questions, is in complete opposition to the idea of the Eden of human rights, where each one of us in freedom and liberty as equals exchanges with anybody else without robbing anybody, without thieving, without forcing, without coercing, without the rule of the fist. The rule of the fist is, however, a manifestation of political power. That cannot be the case. This society of equals has to be entirely depoliticized. And that means 
that the political has to become the monopoly of the state. Within its own sphere, I started the quotation from Mulahama at the beginning, the state cannot have enough power. In other words, it really has to be a monopoly of the political. But outside its own sphere, it ought not to have any power at all. Because outside its spheres, you are meant, society is meant, economy is meant to be entirely depoliticized and governed only by its own preference calculations, following the signals it receives from the pre-free price mechanism. So, they say, the political state, the state which Weber defined as the state that successfully claims the monopoly of political violence, is the presupposition of the depoliticized societies of entrepreneurs, of self-seekers, of greedy people. Yet, they say, once the economic constitution is in place, and it is in place as a consequence of what they say, is an eminently political decision. Once that economic constitution is in place, the state does not abdicate. It has constantly to facilitate, constantly to enable the free economy. <coughs> because within the concept of the free economy, within the concept of the free society, is the danger of greedy self-seeking becoming politicized in terms of what they reject as politicized pluralism. Within the concept of a free society, they say, there also is a tendency, in their terms, a tendency towards proletarianization. Not everybody will do well. Now, what happens if this tendency to proletarianization takes hold? Then society again, they say, is politicized. Mass demands, riots, insurrections. The class tied to work, demanding conditions over and above what the market is able to provide. If the state gives in to that, it does not show strength, it shows weakness. And once it has shown weakness, the door is open, they say, to tyranny. Because the state becomes responsible, they say, for the conditions of the traders in labor power. And once the state is responsible for the conditions of the traders in labor power, then, then, then we no longer have a free labor economy then we have another economy, not a free labor economy. Then we have a Keynesian economy, which is the expression or the manifestation, they say, of thoroughly proletarianized social structures. Then, they say, we have a democratic state, which does not know any limits. It does not know where to stop. It dissolves again as an independent force over and above society and it again lets society come into the state. The state becomes the prey again of those who do the work. What a perverted outcome, they say. Here is the class that works and they seize the seat of government and the state becomes responsible for their plight. Should they not work? Is competition not a human essence? Are we not immoral, therefore, by letting that happen? Does morality not 
dictate that this class should do what it is meant to do. It is in its title. It is in its name. We call this class the working class. No, let it work. That's in its name. So, the state then, for the order levels, is a strong state. It facilitates, enables, it governs. It doesn't let itself become the prey of society. The free economy, the invisible hand, finds its political form in the political state. The economic constitution by which society is governed is an eminently political decision that needs to be made time and time and time again. Now, they say, the free economy is a stateless sphere under state protection. What is protected by the state is not independent from it. Statelessness, the freedom of the economy, is in fact a political decision, is a political uh, practice is a practice of government. Government has to make sure that the free economy is not impeded, that markets are undistorted, that markets are not divided, that markets are undivided. And that is what government has to do day in, day out. That is its liberal utility. So the state is there to eradicate disorder from the economy. And that means the state is there to give order to the economy. The system of rules, the moral and social frameworks. Freedom, they say, presupposes order. There cannot be freedom without order. Freedom without order? Oof! Anarchism. Lynch mobs. It's like in Hobbes' society, no? Each person for himself. So they say. Like Hobbes' society requires Leviathan to guarantee the fundamental sociability of the unsocial society of Hobbes' world. So, they say, the free economy requires the strong state as the force that renders the many so unsocial interests social. Now, step back one bit. Competition. Is that a force of social unity or is it a force of social disunity? Is competition a force of an inclusive society or a society where each of us uses his or her elbow to, uh, to succeed? And the elbow really needs to be used because if you don't use it, you're going to get kicked. <coughs> You fall to the ground. Competition is a concept of winners and losers. It doesn't make sense to say that in competition everybody is a winner. That's certainly not the case. So competition is a concept of a disunity, of a society that lacks cohesion, of a society that lacks fundamental sociability. Competition is a concept of the unsocial society, each for him or herself, in struggle. Now, who checks that? Who gives cohesion? 
Who says these are the rules of the game? What therefore they say competition requires is the strong state that provides for the fundamental sociability of the, for the unsocial interests, that gives cohesion to the many interests in deadly cutthroat competitive struggle against each other. Now, they say, let's look at this tendency towards proletarianization. What sort of society is that? One riven by class interests, class struggles. Where the class tied to work struggles day in and day out, not for some great ideas, no, for food, for housing, for lifetime, for electricity, for roofs, for beds. That's what they struggle for. Is that a society at peace with itself? Here are the rich guys. They have it all. And there is the mass of the society struggling. 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 That, they say, is not a society at peace with itself. It is always a society on the brink of politicizing, of open warfare, of class struggles. That society, they say, that society needs to be pacified. It is true, they say, antagonistic relations cannot be reconciled. They are either antagonistic or they are not, but they need to be reconciled. This bourgeois society is a society of deadly competitive struggle and irreconcilable class antagonism. That bourgeois society, they say, needs to be civilized. Bourgeois society needs to be transformed into a civil society, they say. And the force of that civilization is the state, the pacifier, the domestifier, the enabler, the enforcer, the facilitator of what they say is this fantastically great system of liberty. So the state is quite powerful. The state, as it were, embodies the whole. To make the same point differently, Adam Smith. He said, so a tremendous class struggle, Adam Smith says, in the wealth of nation in this society. The, ma the masters, he says, want to give as little as possible. The working man, he says, wants to get as much as possible. And this, he says, is an ongoing struggle for the auto liberals. The strong state is placed in this zone of conflict, not reconciling, but pacifying the struggle on the on the basis of the system of liberty, of entrepreneurship, of self-responsibility and liability. Now, let me come to my conclusion. I haven't checked my time, so I don't know how far I've gone. We talked for about 15 minutes. How much? 15 minutes. 15? Yeah. Five zero? Uh, this discussion? No, no, we, you have talked for 15 minutes right now, but you have had like right. 10 to 15 minutes. So, my first conclusion, I have to invent a couple of more. Um, <coughs> my first conclusion. 
for the order liberals, the existence of the state entails state intervention. That's not in question. What is in question is the kind of state intervention, its purpose and its objective. The order liberals see the state as a sort of market police. That is what the state is, market police. It's the policeman of the market. The order liberals also say that from within the market there is no automaticity that renders the market capable of reproduction. It is a political decision. The invisible hand does not do anything by itself. It is an invisible hand also by means of the strong state as the political form of the invisible hand. So, here we have a crisis. Is it an economic crisis? Or is it a crisis of state intervention? For the other liberals, clearly, the economy cannot go into crisis because it's the stateless sphere enabled and facilitated by the state. So if there is an economic crisis, it is in fact a crisis of political intervention. The economy did not do well, they say, because the state turned a blind eye to the sociological consequences, to the illiberal use of, of, of economic might. Cartels emerged, monopolies emerged. And economy is in crisis because hmm, there was possibly too little regulation and too much at the same time. When I was in Britain in 2008, they interviewed a woman by the name of Ruth Lear, who was the chairwoman of the Chamber of Commerce. She was asked, no, oh, Ruth, why, why did the economy go into crisis? Oh, she said, too little, too little regulation on financial markets. Ah, Ruth, what shall we do? Oh, she said, we have to regulate less. And it makes absolute sense from this liberal perspective. The state always regulates too much and too little. The economy can never be at fault because it's crisis ridden because the invisible hand was hindered. The invisible hand was impeded. Markets were distorted. Markets were not undivided. There were greedy self-seekers on these markets. The state did not look out for them. There, were a te there was a tendency to proletarianization and the state was too weak and therefore listened to them and therefore distorted markets by welfare state interventionism. Whatever it is for the neoliberals, the economy has nothing which is crisis ridden unless, of course, it is distorted. It is impeded, unless the invisible hand was not given full range. What therefore needs to be done is to facilitate the invisible hand by unimpeding, by removing distortions, by removing welfare state entitlements. Therefore, the response to the crisis in 2008, a response that was socialistic, the financial system was refinanced, financial socialism, and austerity driven, in other words, money was taken out of the pockets of workers in order for the financial system to be rescued. Financial socialism and austerity is therefore a very understandable re response from the neoliberals. The market is in crisis, the economy is in crisis, because it was not facilitated sufficiently <coughs> enough. First conclusion. Second conclusion, 
which I now make up. And that is to do with the idea of democracy. How do you contain it? How do you contain it? How do you allow mass democracy to flourish and at the same time hinder it? <coughs> Bind it, as it were. Tie it to the liberal foundation of the state. In, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the answers were not so obvious. There was demand for a coup d'etat by some conservative politician. Government by emergency, uh, sorting the things out and then returning to the democratic system. That, of course, could not be argued after 1945 or 49. So what needed to be done? In parts, one answer, amongst many, was in fact European integration. The creation of supranational interstate structures of laws and regulation over which the mass democratic constituency has no power of intervention, of intervening, of regulation, of changing. It changed, as it were, the rules of liberty by depoliticizing them or de-democratizing them from their democratic, removing them from their democratic constituencies. This is best expressed, I guess, with a quotation from Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle, resistance fighter, great French nationalist, came back to power as the first president of the Fifth Republic, 1958-59, uh, so shortly after the signature was had dried on the treaties of Rome, and there was France implementing old treaty provisions, and people had thought that France under de Gaulle would not do that. France first, not some European stuff. He was asked, why, why, why do you do that, Charles? And the Gaulle said, no, the decision is very easy. The European market forces French industry to adjust its productivity to competitive levels by itself. And I, he says, don't even have to change my policies. Second example. German Chancellor Schmidt, in the late 1970s, uh, negotiated an intergovernmental exchange rate mechanism, the European monetary system. Uh, it was not part of the EU or EEC or EC structure, whatever the European Union was called at the time. It was outside the system. Uh, all currencies were tied against each other and moved against each other, and the beneficiary was the German mark. And he was asked, what's the politics of it? Oh, he said, it's really simple. The Italians now can have the historical compromise. The Communist Party can be in government. Because they cannot do anything about monetary policy. It's outside their grasp. It's gone. So the very important institution of policy making, monetary policy making, became, as it were, insulated or removed from democratic policy making, from mass democratic interference, and it became itself depoliticized as an effect solely of technocratic intervention, technocratic fine tuning by experts who do that because of their expertise, the insight into economic requirements, not because they are politicians. Let's look at European Monetary Union. How does European Monetary Union strengthen the liberal utility of the state? Now, if you look at Monetary Union, clearly at the very top is the, is the Euro. It's the only currency in the world that hasn't got a state. It's a stateless currency. No state is in a position to call it 
his or her or its currency. It's a stateless currency. It is governed by rules, not by political pressures, not by democratic demands. It is all, almost as I think it was called Padua Schiopa, the Italian economist who was deeply involved with creating European Monetary Union. He said about the, the ECB and the Euro. No, I said it's like a depersonalized prince. But Machiavelli's prince, no republic, nobody to form, nobody is personally responsible, but it works on the basis of set rules over and above the principalities of the member states. So an entirely depoliticized, rule-based, stateless currency. There is no state in there as such. Next is fiscal policy. Who is responsible for it? Formally, the member states. There is no European fiscal union. But the union is involved as well. It says how much deficits you can have. And what happens to you if you have deficits? What's the punishment? If you set a budget, you have to go to Europe first to make sure it fits the, the rules and regulations. And then you can go back to your parliaments and say, no, here we go, Let's, let us endorse it. it uh, it's fit for purpose. So fiscal policy is somewhere in the twilight zone. Neither national nor supranational. Fiscal responsibility resides with member states, and yet member states do it according to rules over which they singularly and individually have no power. Labour market policy. Who is responsible for that? Entirely the member states. No adjustment to global prices can come from monetary policy. The Greeks can't devalue their currency because they haven't got one anymore. They cannot adjust by manipulating exchange, an exchange rate of a currency over which they have no longer control. Adjustment. Can it come from fiscal policy? Can you use fiscal policy to refinance, as it were? To do a bit of Keynesianism? To put money into the economy? Not in Europe, because fiscal policy is pro-cyclical, not anti-cyclical <coughs> in the European context. When a crisis hits, it's expected that the tax base erodes a little bit, so your, the state gets less taxes. At the same time as the demand on state expenditure grows, <coughs> that tends to create a deficit. But the European Union says deficits of a certain amount are not sustainable. Fiscal policy has to be there to facilitate sound money. Where then is adjustment to come from? According to the European Union, it comes from competitive labour markets. Where labour markets in the European Union compete against each other on the basis of productivity and other such matters. Who is responsible for enforcing this free labour economy in the European context? Each of the member states, of course. The member states' liberal utility has greatly been strengthened by monetary union. Each of these states is democratically constituted each of these states has a democratic mandate. This democratic mandate does not really extend to monetary policy. It does not really extend either to fiscal policy, but it extends to the attempt of creating, by means of labor and employment policies, a competitive national economy. So the European Union, in that sense, in fact, does what the older liberals ask for from 
the state. It strengthens, reasserts the liberal utility of the state as the coercive force that depoliticizes society, depoliticizes the economic conduct, and renders the free labor economy free, makes it a free labor economy by political decision and by constant effort at enabling and facilitating the freedom of labor. And that really is now the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Werner, for this uh, mesmerizing uh, lecture. And now uh, we have some time for questions on the debate. So. Okay. Um, yes, I would, I would like to first turn to the beginning to spoke about a relation of uh, order liberals to fascism. And I, I would wonder what were the were there any what were the theoretical fault lines where they split regarding the question of fascism, where some set of it. That's, um, and what what was their criteria for deciding one way or the other? Should I do it? Yes. Yeah. Well the dividing line I guess was <coughs> Let me start later. Let me start in 1973. <coughs> Hayek uh, and also Milton Friedman uh, supported the uh, Pinochet dictatorship. So there is support for dictatorship. Uh, they never supported the Cuban dictatorship, uh, supported the Pinochet dictatorship. So there seem to be two different dictatorships. One which needs to be supported as far as they are concerned, and one that needs to be opposed. But first, why did Hayek argue, what did Hayek say when asked, why, why do you support this? And he said, a democracy, I remember, which does not know how to limit itself, yeah, is limitless, and becomes tyrannical. A dictatorship, he said, may know how to limit itself and is therefore more liberal in its policies. So, Pinochet was therefore endorsed as somebody who sets the economy free, who distinguishes state from society and thereby renders the state the independent force of a free, open, free economy and an open society. By means of force yeah, that was supported. I guess the Cuban, Cuba was not supported because that is the dictatorship is precisely does the opposite. It politicizes. Everything in Cuban society is a political matter, it's a matter of state and state regulation. Yeah. Therefore that dictatorship for them was limitless. It was the outcome of too much democracy as it were. Yeah, so far okay. Now, if you go back to, to fascism, <coughs> those who went into exile, Röpke and Rüstow went to, went to Istanbul, said that this dictatorship in fact politicizes the economy, politicizes society. And therefore, it is a dictatorship that does not know how to limit itself. On that basis, they left. It was not a dictatorship for decency, as far as they saw it. Eucken went into internal exile. And in fact, he also resisted Heidegger at Freiburg University. Heidegger wanted to introduce the leadership principle. In English, it sounds quite harmless. In German, it's the Führerprinzip. Into, uh, into Freiburg University, and, uh, and Eucken resisted that. 
So he resisted. Uh, and apparently he resisted that for the same reasons as the others who went to exile. The famous uh, order or founding order, Lebel müller Amak, was the only one, the only famous one, who supported the Hitler dictatorship. Because in his view, uh, the society was so maribound, German society, that only by moving the state into society and actively sorting society out from within was that to be rescued for liberty. Could the free economy, entrepreneurial initiative be reborn? So for him, the politicization of society, which involved a state-led civil war, was the utter necessity for, for liberty. He didn't hold these views, of course, after 45, but was quite proud of them in 1933. <clears throat> Can you explain how, in the order liberal tradition, the rules are decided upon? Uh, who decides upon them? And most importantly, how does the uh, order liberal society or political state achieve that the private interests are not inscribed into the rules and into the uh, state interventions that are necessary by the political state? The uh, order liberals were the first liberals, as it were, who responded uh, to the collectivist threat. The collectivist threat was the threat of mass democracy, but also Bolshevism and, uh, and Keynesianism, but also the New Deal in America. That was for them the collectivist threat. Now, if you put this into perspective, late 2020s, only 12 or so years earlier, the old world, the old liberal world, had fallen apart. Uh, the, the German Revolution, the establishment of a fully fledged democracy, of a mass democracy, etc. Now, democracy, they would argue, works for as long as it is a democracy of friends, not a democracy that includes the others. Yeah. Now, the democracy of France means the liberal state has in society a liberal constituency which provides the basis for, 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 for liberal government. With the revolution, this society, which had a liberal constituency, disappeared. Yeah. Therefore, for the liberal state, for the making of policy, <coughs> democracy, mass democracy, became a problem. Yeah? The, liberal, the, 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 the idea of democracy as a democracy of friends no longer held, because there was this mass movement, mass emotions, mass demands, etc., which were the masses, and therefore created the sort of mass democracy that led, in their words, to forms of ungovernability. So how, how to rescue, that's the question, I guess, how to rescue this liberty from the democracies of the others? One way was the 1950s, by means of European integration. I don't think it was a, consciously, a conscious thing, it just it happened, it fell to them, but it was formed in such a way that it in fact worked. The other was the, constant, the conscious effort of an independent constitutional court that can adjudicate on the legal, on the legal strong, on the lawfulness of parliamentary lawmaking. So if parliament by, by means of its, of its power makes a law which is then looked at by the constitutional court, scrutinized, the Constitutional Court in the, German, in the German context can strike down, can declare nil and void a parliamentary law because it declares that law to be unconstitutional. In other words, not legitimate, regardless of the democratic procedure. That was one way in which in the 1950s, by means of institution building, the idea of the liberal state 
was preserved. It was given to experts, it was given to judges who were unable to sit in judgment over parliamentary lawmaking. Yeah. Uh, you can also, of course, talk, talk in this context about independencies of, of central banks that make monetary policies according to what they understand to be the requirements of economic fine-tuning, but removing, as it were, from this policy-making any democratic influence, any, any democratic uh, demands, any democratic policy-making, rendering the pursuit of liberty an exercise of <coughs> technical fine-tuning by experts. Yeah. But policy thereby becomes liberty, or becomes the basis for the enforcement and for the enabling of a system of liberty, regardless of what sort of election outcomes uh, the election brought about. So what that brings to mind is in fact the transformation of democracy in terms of what Schumpeter, another, not older liberal, but another liberal thinker, defined democracy to be. Namely, he said, uh, fantastic means, uh, best thing ever invented for the peaceful circulation of uh, competing uh, political managers. Any other questions? No, I had one. Basically, I'm wondering if you could uh, elaborate on something which seems, at least at first glance, as an ambiguity of this uh, order liberal uh, conception of the intertwinement uh, of the state and the market. Uh, namely, on the one hand, a lot of order liberals emphasize. Uh, I'm thinking here, for example, of Alexander Rustov, that state has to be an independent entity. It has to be independent from the society or from the economy, and some of his you know, statements are uh, reminiscent, for example, almost of Marx, who says that the state has to assume a form uh, which uh, stands above uh, society, uh, of an instance which stands above society, but on the uh, other hand, um, they also uh, speak about uh, they speak that we cannot uh, that we cannot uh, basically conceptualize the state <coughs> on the one hand and economy on the other as two distinct spheres. So economy is always already a political economy. Economy is always always embedded in the state, and the state is always embedded in the economy. So uh, on the other hand, this conception basically. Uh, and it goes, uh, or at least implies, you know, that the state is not completely independent. So I'm just asking, uh, how do these two uh, claims or these two conceptions go together? Okay. Um, the difficulty of thinking about neoliberalism is because one is somehow preformed in one's thinking about it by by the idea that it has to do with market versus the state. And then, of course, the great resolution to everything is state versus the market. That's then the return of the state and, and things are better because now it's the state versus the market. And it's this sort of thinking, market versus the state, state versus the market, that, is, that misses the insights that these people bring to, to our understanding completely. Because for them, the market and the state are not two distinct social forms of organization. They are not distinct social forms of organization. They do not ask about how can the market operate against the state or how can the state operate against the market. For them, that's a non-question. For them the question is, what sort of market economy, or what sort of economy do we want? Quite na naively put. If it's a free labor economy, what therefore do we have to do to have it? Hmm? And that then is the question of the political. As the power, as the force of doing it. The market remains for the order liberals, free, depoliticized, at liberty, where everybody is an equal, governed by the price mechanism. 
is such a safe only because of the political constitution of an economic order that is constantly policed by market by the state in its in its in its form as market police. So state there the economy, the free economy is in fact state dependent. From within itself, it has no power of constitution. Its constitution is an eminently political decision and an eminently political praxis and remains so. They will even say, as I, as I mentioned in my talk, there cannot be an economic crisis because the economy is nothing else but us being facilitated and enabled by means of an economic constitution for which the state is responsible. Yeah? So far okay? Now, the idea of the state of market police presupposes the state as an independent power. Therefore, the state has no role to play in the economy. It is not a producer. It is not a politicizer. Or it is so only on the basis that the state has gone astray. It's no longer a liberal state. And this idea of the state as market police is not something that is original, as it were, to the, to the older liberals. You, in fact, find the same argument in Adam Smith where the state in Adam Smith is described as police. For Adam Smith, too, the invisible hand has no independent being. The co competition in Adam Smith is, dis is a disuniting force. The state is responsible for keeping the system together. The state is responsible in Adam Smith to provide a system of justice. The state in Adam Smith is responsible to provide for the economy the rules upon which its civil conduct rests. The state is responsible in Adam Smith to punish those who do not obey by the rules. The state in Adam Smith is responsible to work against monopolies or tendencies, the tendency to hold monopolization. The state is responsible to move against bloodshed, in other words, against cutthroat competition. And the state is responsible also as an educator and as a facilitator of the working class. The working class and Smith can only benefit from the system of liberty if it lets itself ex be exploited well, and the better it lets itself be exploited, the greater, in the end, he argues, is the liberal reward for labor, i.e. the trickle-down effect, where even the poor get affluent, and that, he says, is a matter of police. And police here does not mean the policeman or the policewoman, but police here means public policy. It's a matter of public policy. What the older liberals do is they re, as it were, rediscover that notion of the state, as, the, as Marx criticized this when he argued in the Communist Manifesto that the state is the executive committee of the bourgeoisie, was in fact a critique of Smith's conception of the state as a concentrated and aiming and facilitating force and power of a free, of a free economy. And the order liberals rediscovered this executive committee as the one that you can let, not let go astray, as the one that you have to have in order to guarantee <coughs> and secure uh, the economic freedom that they were after. Can I have one more quotation? Van Mises, in one of his early works, he was the one that Ristoff and others said, oh, he is a theologian. He just believes in the market forces, as everything, that, that, as a thing that resolves everything. And there is Van Mises writing that, and writing and writing and writing about freedom and market forces and price mechanisms. And then he says, oh, we need to be grateful for, for Italian fascism for having rescued a European civilization. So even there, the state, as it were, comes in, not necessarily as a preemptive, preventative decision maker, but as the rescuer of civilization, of a market order that seemingly had gone down the, the drain. So I think it's wrong to think about neoliberalism in terms of market versus the state or state versus the market, because for them the market is a political praxis. It is a praxis of them. 
government. And that is what has to be understood. Otherwise, I think one looks at neoliberalism as free market and the night watchman state. What the hell is the night watchman state? A, st a state that watches over you during the night when you are asleep and cannot protect your property by yourself. That's say the, the neo laissez-faire liberals is the law of the state, a night watchman state. The auto liberals say, and so also do the neoliberals, the state is not a night watchman state. It's a day watchman state. It is to secure that you use your freedoms for, for the sake of freedom and not for illiberal means. And if I can just add, Hayek, the road to serfdom. He says, the state, he says, is a planner. The state plans for competition. That is its purpose. That is its role. And that again is not state versus market or market versus state. That is what I started off with, namely Adam Smith. Political economy is the science of the statesman and legislator. It is not the science of the market. It is the science of the statesman and legislator, so that they make rules and laws that enable the free economy, facilitate the free economy. Move against monopolies. Move against the interests of the masters, if the interests of the masters are at variance with the needs of liberty. Yes, we still have time for some questions or comments or whatever. Not, uh, I have another question. Uh, maybe, uh, do you think there is a certain uh, contradiction also in order liberal talk, and especially, for example, in uh, people like Hayek, uh, who, uh, on the one hand, always emphasizes or stresses that, uh, hey, the state uh, has to make people into entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs which are capable of spontaneous uh, activity and uh, persons who are able to engage, not of course politically, but engage on the market. If they don't succeed in this, it's their own fault. Uh, as you said, uh, ordo liberalism or neoliberalism also uh, basically puts the fault for, say, unemployment to the shoulders. <laughs> those who are unemployed. Uh, however, uh, at one point, Hayek is basically uh, forced to uh, recognize or to admit that uh, market doesn't reward people according to their merit. Uh, market basically doesn't care about merit. But this would, on the other hand, mean that uh, it's not, for example, uh, the poor, I mean, it's not the unemployment, uh, the, the unemployed person fault if he is uh, unemployed. So, uh, and I think that I know, this is a symptom of uh, a certain uh, ambiguity, which is that on the one hand he has this stress, spontaneity, but on the other uh, everything uh, dissolves at the end into an uh, outright uh, fatalism of the market, because this spontaneity is basically the, I don't know, spontaneity of following uh, market uh, you know, signals which are produced in advance uh, without uh, you having to do anything or without you doing anything else. So, look, Hayek says the market is, is true, he says, there is great poverty. Great poverty. Yet, he says, it's the best possible system as yet invented. So that's it. If you want to invent a better system, do it. But no, nobody has come up with a better idea. That's, that's his response to, to that question. Spontaneous order. Yes, but only if it's ordered. In other words, within a framework, within a moral framework, within a social framework, within a legal framework. So you can be as spontaneous as you want to be, but not in an illiberal sense. You cannot spontaneously politicize society. You cannot spontaneously start a riot, as it were. 
You cannot spontaneously do all those sorts of things which do not facilitate the market. The spontaneous order is an order of market facilitation. And that's what the limits of the framework of spontaneity is. It's not more than that. So it is in fact a spontaneous order that is ordered, or based on order, founded on order, and constantly, um, as it called, this constant surveillance to make sure that each one of us is spontaneous in the right way and not the wrong way. <laughs>